Well, good morning and welcome to the fourth lecture of our course. So today the main point will be proving Kuklevin theorem. Uh, we'll recall its formulation. So let's just short recap. We have the P class. This is the class of decision problems. So these are algorithmic questions with a yes no answer. And uh, we input the data as some word of an alphabet, and there is the length of the input, and the worst case complexity should be bounded by a polynomial of the length of the input. So the NP class uh, will have several equivalent definitions. There are mainly two of them that you can use by non-deterministic computations, where at some points your execution can non-deterministically branch. And there is angelic choice, so if at least one path of the execution yields yes, then we say that the answer is yes. And uh, this can implement non-deterministic guesses. And the classic example, say in a graph, you can find some objects. Some, here is a Hamiltonian cycle as an example, but also it could be some specific coloring of the graph. Or maybe more, more familiar one to us, it's uh, satisfying assignment for a Boolean formula, say 3CNF. If your machine is non-deterministic, you can just guess the correct answer, and uh, then you win. So, um, okay, the second definition, we didn't put it on the slide here, is the definition using uh, hints, that someone gives you a hint, and given the hint, you can check that it is a correct one in polynomial time. And the existence of such a hint is the guarantee that your answer is yes, again, for Boolean satisfiability, the hint is the satisfying assignment. So this is the notion of reduction. Um, so you can reduce one problem to another, say problem A to problem B. If you can take the input for problem A, somehow pre-process it and submit it as an input data to B. And then you just run B once and check it. And the idea is that if you can solve B in some way, then you can also solve A because you just compute this F and then you ask this B. And there are NP hard problems. These are the hardest problems in the, well, they are harder than any problem in the NP class. So any problem with NP is reducible to B. And NP complete problems are those who are NP hard, but they are themselves in NP. So they are not so hard. And this is the classical theorem, which is Kuklevin theorem, that satisfiability for Boolean formula. Now the formula are arbitrary. Uh, they are not required to be even, say, in CNF, it's NP-complete. So first it is an NP problem. This is easy because, again, this satisfying assignment is a hint, and uh, it's polynomial size, and checking that it's correct satisfying assignment is polynomial, polynomially solvable. But also any A, which is in NP, it is M reducible to set. So any NP problem can be encoded as satisfiability for Boolean formula. This is the idea. So we had an example, the graph coloring example, that uh, there is an NP, NP problem and we reduce it to SAT. It's true colorability of graphs. So we color the vertices of a graph into colors of a set C. Well, actually, the only thing which is meaningful here is the number of colors. And uh, the coloring is called correct if each edge connects vertices of different colors. So formally, we have this function from vertices to colors. And if two vertices are connected, then uh, the colors will be different. For example, three coloring, RGB, red, green, blue. This is a three color graph. This is not because the central point has, wouldn't have any color. And it is NP, and we reduce it to set. So we have a graph. And we should construct a Boolean formula which actually expresses the idea that this graph is recolorable. So any satisfying assignment of this formula will be a coloring of the graph. And the reducing function is going to be polynomially computable. So again, this is just a recap. So we have three variables for each vertex. And we have this formula which represents the natural condition that uh, the graph, that th this is a correct coloring. So each vertex has only one color. And for each edge, we have that it couldn't be 
of the same color. Here it's, it's in particular a 3 CNF. It will not always be the case, but here it is the case. So it means that if sad were solved by polynomial time, so it would have been three color. And the Cook Levin theorem says that if A is in NP, then A is M reducible to set for any problem A. So beforehand, Lux lecture, now we proved that a concrete A, which is three color, it's uh, M reducible to set. But now we're going to show it for any NP problem. Okay. So we need to show that A reduces to set for any A in NP. And we use a formal model of computation, which is the model of Turing machines. So in a Turing machine, I will omit this slide, we just show this one. Um, we have the tape, which is infinite memory of the machine. The machine observes one of the cells of the tape, and it can do some operations in, in this. So it can read this AI, also use its internal memory from a finite set Q, it can replace something, the, the element which is in this cell, and also it uh, can move one step left to right. So this, these are the rules. So you have this internal state, you check whether A is correct, and then you shift to QBD, which means that you change your internal state of mind to Q, you uh, change the tape symbol would be and you move or maybe you don't move so left right or nothing our determinism of course here okay that is the important church turing thesis that any computation on a reasonable computing device can be performed on the turing machine so this is a complete model of computation which means that uh, any program can be re reprogrammed in this. It's a very restricted model, but you can simulate anything here. And it preserves polynomiality. So it may not preserve uh, the degree of the polynomial, but polynomiality is preserved. And now we we'll return to Cook Levin. So the proof sketch, the main idea of the proof. And now we're going to go a bit slower. Uh, if you have questions, please ask, because this is some sort of a bit of hard material. Uh, but uh, we'll try to make it without too many details. So uh, suppose you have A, which is NP, and we, we have to reduce it to set. And the problem here is that we don't know the nature of A. We don't know what exactly this problem is. We don't only know that it is solvable on a non-deterministic Turing machine. And we shall encode this configuration as a binary word. So this is the encoding, how it is performed. So, or, well, first we, we start with the idea that the first letter is, so let, let's, it's for just for simplicity, think that the tape grows only to the right. So here the tape is sort of fixed and you cannot go to the left of it. It's not a significant restriction and this is still a Turing complete model of computation. And now we encode it as a binary word. So here you have letters A1, A2, AI, AI plus 1. These letters are from some finite alphabet. And you can encode them as bytes, as uh, um, binary words which are long enough to encode our alphabet. This is polynomial because you just have a logarithmic say, length of extension for us. And now you encode this uh, state, which is Q. So Q is also a, an element of a finite set, the finite set of possible states. And suppose we encoded this as a word of M bits. And then we put also padding 0, 0, M, 0, M, 0, M, and this Q is not 0. It's some word which is not just zeros. Why we do this just to align the, uh, the word. So our idea would be that we will write these configurations one over another, and uh, we wish to this A1 to inherit the corresponding A1 in the line below. Therefore, we for in at one place here we put this state Q, and uh, here we put just placeholders, which says that this is not 
that these are not the cells which are observed, but the ice cell is observed. AI. Is that clear? How do well, it's, it's a technical thing? We just it's an encoding of the configuration using binary words, as you usually do in the computer. And now we have the notion of protocol. So a protocol of a machine is the list of configurations. So the machine starts with the starting configuration, where the tape includes uh, the word, the input word X, and uh, it observes the first letter of this word, and the state is some initial state Q0. And then each next line is the next step of the execution of the machine. And this can be encoded as a binary matrix. You see that each line is of this form, it's the code of the configuration. And the next line is, um, and so we have several rows. How many rows? Number of rows is this one. It's a polynomial of X, which is this um, um, number of steps which we perform. We know that the machine, or the, it is non-deterministic. But the machine performs uh, not no more than polynomial number of steps, right? And here, this is the length of each row. And why this holds? Well, uh, because um, each row, if you see it here, it is, uh, well, it's the original word. But then, well, the, the machine could run and up to the end of this word and start going further. So the tape is potentially infinite. But uh, <coughs> each step can increase the active area of the tape, which we call the zone, only in one, one element. So this means that um, the length of the word, which is on the tape now, well, in removing the blanks padding to the right, is also bounded by a polynomial, because the number of steps is bounded by a polynomial. The length of the original word is just linear. and uh, Therefore, the number of new elements which were added also is polynomially bounded. So this means that this is going to be a matrix of polynomial size. It's uh, the, roughly speaking the square of our original polynomial. And now uh, this matrix, this correct protocol, will be this uh, uh, witness which we are going to encode as a uh, a uh, solution as a satisfying assignment for a Boolean formula. So the idea will be as follows. So this is a binary matrix. It's a tuple of zeros and ones. We denote its elements by Boolean variables, B0, 0, B0, 1, etc., Bij. And we will construct a formula phi, which expresses the fact that this matrix represents a correct protocol of a successful execution of our machine, right? So then it will, will show the following. So X, so we have an NP problem. On our input X, we get one, which means that there is a successful trajectory of execution of the Turing machine on this input X, right? And uh, having this input X, uh, we, uh, this means that there exists a correct protocol. So the, again, the path of execution rep is represented by a protocol, which means that we start with some configuration and then we go further obeying the rules of the Turing machine. And the existence of such a protocol is the same as uh, the answer yes to our problem, and uh, or the existence of some hints or something like that. And this existence of the correct protocol is will be encoded. Is a protocol is represented by a binary matrix. And the fact that this is a correct protocol will be encoded by a Boolean formula. And it's satisfied if and only if the original problem was solvable. Or we got answer yes. So this is the reduction. So for our input data, we shall have a polynomial computable function which will produce the formula which checks this protocol for correctness. And this will going to be a big conjunction of the following claims. So the first one should say that the, the first row represents the configuration with X on the tape and the machine observing its first letter and the state being Q0. The second says that each row is obtained from the previous one using one of the rules. 
And the last row, in the third condition, is that the last row includes state QF and analysis, yes. So we represent as a large Boolean formula, which is a big, a huge conjunction, uh, these three ideas. And if they're all satisfied, this means that we have a correct protocol. So this is all expressible as Boolean formula. We're not going into details, but well, it's uh, quite believable. For example, the first one, we just have to check that the first row is equal to a concrete Boolean word. So it means that the first symbol should be say zero, the second should be one. So this is just a line of equivalences. The third is the same, that in the last row we should include state QF. And we can say that uh, QF is a looping state, that it's uh, if we finish, then everything else is padded by the same state QF. And the second is less trivial, but also easy. We just have to locate the place. So here in the encoding of, uh, of this, we have zeros. If it is zero, we just basically don't change anything. But then we say that if there is a non-zero block, which is the real state Q, then we just uh, say, OK, uh, we look up at our, we have a so big disjunction that it's either this way or this way or this way, depending on our state Q. And we co compare it with the next one. So this is ex expressible as a Boolean formula. And the reduction function takes X and generates this big Boolean formula from X. Actually, if you see here that only the first row, the first condition depends on X. Everything else is just obtained from the definition of our problem, from the Turing machine which solves our original problem A, and B machine. And this is the condition that if the answer was yes, then our formula is satisfiable and vice versa. Thus, our problem A is reducible to set. And now recall that A was an arbitrary NP problem. It was not just a concrete one like we did it for, say, three color. It was an arbitrary one. So the only thing we needed about it is that there is a non-deterministic Turing machine which solves this problem in polynomial time. And this means that SAT is NP hard. So of course, for concrete problems, these reductions could be more natural. And recall our example with graph coloring. In the example with graph coloring, we uh, had uh, a concrete reduction so here, um, let's go, the reduction was as follows. So a graph was colorable in three colors, if and only if this formula was satisfied, was satisfiable. So each coloring is a satisfying assignment, vice versa. This is a natural encoding, which naturally encodes our idea that it is, it is colorable. Uh, the general reduction which we used for cook levin theorem is not that, say, natural in a sense, because if we apply our, uh, say, general proof to a three color, it will be not this formula, because how would it work? It would say the following, okay, we have three colorability. This is um, a problem which is non-deterministically polynomially satisfiable, so decidable, right? It's NP problem. What does it mean? It means that take given a graph, we can, uh, we have a, a, an algorithm which uh, non-deterministically colors it. So well, how does this algorithm work? Well, actually, it starts coloring. It takes the first vertex, colors it into some color non-deterministically, then the second, the third, etc. And finally, it checks that everything is correct. So this is a non-deterministic algorithm. It involves non-deterministic guessing, as we know. So uh, this means that uh, if the graph is colorable, not every path of this algorithm would give the coloring. But uh, there will exist a path which is a correct one and which will color the graph correctly. So, OK. And uh, then how will we reduce it to SAT? Not in this way, unfortunately, in this natural good way. We reduce it in a very, say, tedious but universal way, which means that we take this algorithm, which somehow colors the graph, and then we say, OK, uh, if the graph is colorable, then there exists, a, a, say, a successful path in the, of this algorithm, successful execution. This successful execution has a protocol. 
and this protocol should obey the conditions which were expressed as a Boolean formula. But this will be a very big Boolean formula which encodes all this, all the peculiarities of this algorithm. So it will include all this stuff which is now under the carpet words, how we encode the graph as a Boolean word, how we check that it is really colorable, uh, where do we keep all these uh, edges and stuff like that. So all the details of the implementation, first you implement this non-deterministic algorithm and say your normal programming language, but enhanced with non-determinism, and then you um, encode this on a Turing machine and do all this stuff. So this will be much far harder than the encoding here, but the virtue of it is that it is uh, universal. So this encoding works for any NP problem. And this shows NP hardness of SAT. On the other side hand, SAT is itself an NP problem, so it is NP complete. And uh, now again we recall what is all this stuff good for? Well, uh, there is the P class and NP class. And uh, unfortunately, we don't know whether they are the same. This is a big open problem. So uh, if they are the same, all this stuff is meaningless. Because what would this mean? This means that SAT in particular would be solvable in polynomial time. Having SAT solvable in polynomial time, well, we can reduce and A is also polynomially solvable, we can just reduce anything to anything in polynomial time because we don't need any reductions. Everything is just easily solvable by itself. But uh, the common belief is that it is not P. So, and P is not equal to P. This is the common belief that it's the, the classes are different. And provided that P is not equal to NP, we show that SAT is not P. So, why? Because if SAT would be P, then taking any problem from NP will reduce it and also get it to P. So if SAT is polynomial, any problem in NP is polynomial. And uh, if P is not equal to NP, this is not the case. Therefore, this cook levin theorem is, uh, has the following idea. If we have at least one hard problem in NP, then SAT is one of these problems. So concretizing hardness. We started with the conjecture, which is not proved, unfortunately, that there exist hard problems in NP, and we return to the fact that SAT is one of them. It's an NP hard problem. So he will stop and I will ask whether you have questions on the proof of Kuk Levin. So is the, at least the basic idea should be clear. All the details they are they could be filled, but the basic idea is that of the reduction is that the witness is the protocol of uh, the so as I say, it's fine assignment, as the witness is the protocol of the correct run of the theory machine. And this can be encoded as a Boolean formula. So this is actually one of the, um, one of these uh, places where we see that the logical language of Boolean formula is quite expressible. We can express any Turing machine run as a Boolean formula. So now we prove a specific version of SAT, which is a 3 SAT. We also prove it at MP complete. So 3SAT is a special version of SAT where only three CNFs are allowed. So we know well, why three? Well, we know that 2SAT is well, 2SAT is satisfiability for uh, two CNFs. So this means that each clause in the CNF has two literals. We know that this is polynomially solvable, and even some of you did it uh, as a practical uh, task. Okay, so this is this is nice. Uh, one set is trivial, but three set is non-trivial. As we know, we also did it in the, one of our seminars that uh, if you have three CNFs, so each clause may include one, two, or three literals. When we try to apply resolution, this could uh, lead to exponential blow up, and we don't see any possible uh, satisfiability solver even for three CNF. And we see that, and we'll show that it's actually NP complete. So if 2 SAT is polynomial, 3 SAT is NP hard. Of course, it is reducible to SAT. Well, just the reduction here is trivial. We just take the same formula. So if you can do SAT for arbitrary Boolean formula, you can, of course, do it for 3 CNF as a particular case. But we need opposite reduction. We need to uh, reduce general SAT 
which were proved to be NP hard, we need to reduce it to 3SAT. And this would make, make 3SAT also NP hard because any problem is reducible to SAT, SAT is, will, will be reducible to 3SAT, which will mean that uh, the latter is also hard, right? So this again, the backwards reduction. If you wish to prove that, so this is, I always repeat that because many people get confused. If you wish to prove that something is easy, one way of doing it is to reduce it to something for which you already know that it is easy, solvable, or stuff like that, right? If you know how to do something, and you can reduce to it. If you wish to prove that something is hard, you need to go opposite way. So you have something which is already hard, and you reduce it to that, you conjecture which is hard. So because uh, it is all, all, everything is dual. If you want to prove that something is hard, it should be hard enough. It should be harder than something which is provably hard. It's the same here. If we wish to prove that uh, three sat is hard, we have to reduce sat to it. And this is not trivial because we have to reduce arbitrary formula to three CNF. And uh, this is the theorem that if you have a Boolean formula, which is arbitrary, there exists an equisatisfiable three CNF B of polynomial size. So equisatisfiability means that B is satisfiable if and only if so is A. It doesn't mean that it is equivalent. Because uh, translating to an equivalent uh, 3 CNF is not always possible. Even if you, well, each Boolean formula can be translated into an equivalent CNF, right? But there are two problems. The first problem that this, three, three C, that this CNF could be not a 3 CNF. And uh, for some Boolean formula, there is no equivalent 3 CNF, right? The second is that if you translate it into, into an equivalent CNF, you can get exponential blow up. Because how do you translate it into a CNF? You apply the De Morgan laws, you apply the distributivity. When you apply distributivity, you can get blow up. So you don't construct an equivalent 3 CNF, rather you construct an equisatisfiable 3 CNF. So this is going to be possible. And you see the Mm, the title of the slide, they are called Satin transformations. This is uh, due to Satin, and uh, uh, these are Satin transformations. So any Boolean formula can be transformed equisatisfiably into a 3 CNF. So let's go forward. So, how do, do Satin transformations look like? Well, it looks like translating into assembly like a three address code. So, suppose you have an algebraic expression A plus B multiplied by C plus D. And how do you compute it on a computer? Uh, you have to decompose this into, say, uh, basic operations. So basic operations will be addition and multiplication, add and move. And for each intermediate value, you will have a specific variable. So how do you compute it? You add A to B, store this in T1, add C to D, store this in T2, and then you multiply T1 and T2 and store the result in R, where R is the resulting value. So on the real computer, you usually reuse your, uh, these are, these are just counters and registers, you reuse your memory. So after computing, you can erase and you reuse it once more. Here we'll have immutable variables because there are variables in the Boolean formula. This will mean that for any subformula, we shall have a specific designated variable. It's like in functional programming. You don't your variables are immutable. You don't re rewrite the contents of a variable. And that was the same. <coughs> so for each subformula, we introduce a new variable and write the corresponding equivalences. And here will be an example. So this is a formula which is not a CNF even, right? So it includes implication. This is sort of fine, but the problem is that there is disjunction as the main connective. We could try to transform it into a CNF, but again, we're, we will get blow up in size, and we are not guaranteed that it will be a 3 CNF anyway. anyway. So we we'll have, have to do something more clever. And this is the result. This is the idea. So they are colored in different colors. It's just for, for convenience, because we will continue transformations on that. So for the first subformula, P implies Q will have T1, and say that it's equivalent. For the, this P plus R will have T2, for this, we have T3, and here we see that we already reused T2. T4 is T1 or T3, and the final thing is that T4 should be true. So we wish our formula to be true, satisfied, right? That's the 
the formula is a subformula of itself. We introduce the variable for this, and this variable is should be true, so for the formula to be satisfied. And then we explain what 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 do these variables mean. So what is T4? Okay, T4 is the same as T1 or T3. What is T1? No, T1 is P implies Q. What is T3? Is Q implies T2. What's T2? T2 is P implies R. So this formula is, of course, not equivalent to the original one, because uh, we have new variables, for example. It depends on new variables. But it's equisatisfiable. Why? Because suppose we manage to satisfy the original formula, this would mean that we can we have some variables for P, Q, and R, which make this true. But then we have all the values of the subformulae, and we can make these the assignment for this T, I, right? So if, say, P is true and Q is false, then this should be false, and then T, T1 gets assignment 0, and so on. So if the original formula was satisfiable, this is satisfiable. And also the other way around. Suppose we manage to satisfy this, we have a satisfying assignment. So in particular, we assign some variables to PQR. And then these variables, these values would satisfy this. Because this is satisfiable, which means that T4 is, should be true. T4 is true. This means that this disjunction is true, T1 or T3. OK, then this means that one of the T1 and T3 is true. For example, T3, this means that Q implies T2 is true. This means that Either Q is false or T2 is true. If T2 is true, if P implies R is true. So from this um, assignment for the new formula, we get an assignment for the original one. So they're equisatisfiable. Okay, is this clear? No, it's not, nothing, nothing special. But now it looks much like a 3CNF, right? So at least we have a big conjunction, which is the idea that everything should be satisfied simultaneously. But we have equivalences instead of elementary disjunctions. And in these equivalences on the right, we can have disjunction, which is fine, but we can also have implication, and we have, can have anything else. We can have negation, for example, because the original formula is just a Boolean formula. We are not limited in our language. And now these are transformations into 3CNF by the following tables. So uh, the easiest maybe is negation. So for negation, you have, how do you say that they are uh, different. It's uh, so um, they should not be the same. It means that at least one of them should be one, right? And at least one of them should be zero. So, for example, for disjunction, we had disjunction here again. So, uh, this means there should be two implications. The first one says that if TK is true, then T1, TI or TJ is true. This is not TK or TI or TJ. But there is also another direction. Uh, that direction is that if the disjunction is true, then TK is true. But how, how does, if you uh, say A or B implies C, is the same that A implies C and B implies C, right? So we say that TI should imply TK and TJ should, should imply TK. For conjunction, we have basically the same, but just it's duality. And for implication, we see that implication is not TI or TJ. And we replace TI with not TI here everywhere. And we'll get this. So these are, just, these are just equivalent. So first, we transform our original formula into an equisatisfiable formula, which is closer to the 3CNF than our original formula. This was the first state in transformation, and the second is just replace this with an equivalent 3CNF, just the same 3CNF. And in our example, we get the following. So the first equivalence boils down into these three clauses. There are three CNF, so there, this is, uh, includes three values, and these two include two, but it's okay. Uh, so the blue one is also these three, and uh, the green and the brown one, and finally we have this T4, that this should be true. It's just one literal. So uh, what happened here, we say that for any Boolean formula, there exists an equisatisfiable 3CNF B of polynomial size, which means that this is the reduction. So how do you check A for satisfiability? You take A, like this. You perform Satan transformation 1 and 2. And you run your, and this is the input for 3, three set, right? So we had 
originally we had just an arbitrary Boolean formula. We wanted to check it for satisfiability. We replaced it with this equisatisfiable uh, three CNF and we reduced it to solving three CNFs. Question. Ah, but then we split it. Yes, if we have If you have P or say A and B and C is A and B and C. So we suppose that all the brackets are put there. We do not say use this. Uh, so we, we, formally speaking, in our language, we do not have say ternary conjunction. We have only binary conjunctions. So that's what it means. Is we'll add one more variable or say ten variables if you wish. Okay. More questions on Satan transformation. So what is good about Satan transformation? The good thing is that now we have not only arbitrary satisfiability, but we have an NP-complete problem, which is uh, for a very simple formatted form. And we'll now go into a more, say, a graph theoretical problematics. We'll see the, uh, another example of an NP-complete problem, which is going to be the independent set problem for graphs or inset. So here we'll see that, well, before that, the theory of NP-completeness didn't go into its say, full power and full, say, glory. Because, uh, well, what, what we did, we said, okay, uh, there is this class of NP problems, and from this class we find the hardest one. Well, what is the hardest one? Well, it's, it's generic as it could be because it's a satisfiability for formulae which can express anything, and this is just standard. But here we see that there will be a concrete problem for graphs, which is still going to be NP-complete. So the problem looks not so hard. So three color will be one of these problems, but this will be left as an exercise for you. We'll discuss it in one of the classes. Here we'll to do a simpler one. So again, for three color, what is what happened? We reduced three color to sat, right? But actually, sat is also reducible to three color. It's also NP complete. Here we have independent set. What is independent set? So um, we have a graph, and an independent set is a set which doesn't have edges inside. So uh, in an independent set, no two vertices inside are connected. Okay. So it's dual to what maybe you've heard the term click in a graph. So click is um, a subgraph which is complete, so in which any two are connected. A complete subgraph is a click, and a zero subgraph is an independent set. So okay, this is this should be clear, right? So um, given a graph. And a natural number k, you should, should determine whether this graph has an independent set of k vertices. So each graph has an independent set of one vertex. If the graph is not a complete one, it has an independent set of two vertices. So you find two vertices which are not connected by an edge. If there are three vertices, it means that um, there should be three uh, vertices which uh, do not have any connections and so on and so on. So you have two, in the input you have a pair, you have a graph and you have a natural number. And we shall show now that a three set is a carp reducible to independent set. And uh, this will mean that independent set is NP complete. Of course that, independent set of course belongs to NP, right? The hint is the set itself. So if you have a graph and number K, and you, have, you can do non-deterministic guess, you can just guess the independence set. Okay, I take vertices V1, V10, V15, V100. K is 4. And you check that this is independent. Checking is trivially polynomial because you just look up in the list of edges and say, okay, it belongs, not belongs. So if an independent set is given, it's easy to check that it is uh, really an independent set. But this problem is NP hard. It's NP complete because 3 set is reducible to inset. How do we reduce it? Well, now we are, we are going dual. Okay, so we know that three set is hard. We want to reduce it. So for a given Boolean formula in three CNF, we need to construct a graph and provide natural number k such that the independent set in this graph somehow encodes the satisfying assignment. 
right? So, given a 3CNF, we construct such a graph. And the idea is as follows. So, satisfiability, what, what does it mean? It means that from each clause, we can, can take one literal, so that they form a non-contradictory resulting set of literals, right? So, uh, for example, you see the green letters right here. So, uh, here is a CNF. It's satisfiable. It has three CNF. How do we see that it is satisfiable? Okay, I say I take not y, not W, Y, X, and not Z. Not Z, of course. So um, these, uh, if we make these all true, all these green literals true, we'll make the whole CNF true, right? Because from each clause, you take one literal, you make it true, the whole clause is true, and then you make the whole CNF true because each clause is true. And how can you make them true? Well, they should be non-contradictory. So suppose if we take not this, but the first literal, if we take Z, and at the same time we take not Z, we cannot satisfy it, of course. It cannot be Z and not Z at the same time. But if we take non-contradictory set, what well, it just means that you don't have the same literal and its negation. Then you can easily satisfy it, because you just take W equals 0, y equals 1, x equals 1, and z equals 0, right? So, this is the way of taking a set, making this formula satisfiable. Well, this is not exactly in one-to-one -one correspondence with satisfying assignments, because uh, some of the variables could not appear in this list, right? So, suppose here you have x or w or r, I don't know. We took x and we didn't take, we took neither r nor not r, which would mean that uh, R is just arbitrary. For any R, we have a satisfying assignment. So, this coloring of uh, literals, it just gives you the existence of a satisfying assignment. Maybe not one, but several, it doesn't matter. And now we're going to construct a graph, and it will be constructed in the following way. So, each three clause, each clause of this uh, CNF, which is length exactly three, will be modeled by uh, uh, each three clause will be modeled by a triangle. So each two clause will be modeled by uh, an edge. And if there were um, one clauses, so independent, in isolated literals, they will be modeled just by vertices. And then we connect contradicting literals also. So the result, a K will be the number of clauses. So the resulting graph is as follows. So for each clause, it's this in these blocks, right? So for each clause, we take the corresponding literals as specific vertices, and we connect them together. So this is a triangle, this is a triangle, this is a triangle, here just an edge. For each clause, we have such structure. Okay? And then we connect contradicting literals. So Z and not Z, W and not W, W and another not W here, Y and not Y, Y and not Y, X, not X, not X. Right? And now we wish to find an independent set of four vertices. So here we have such a set. You see it here. These are four vertices. No one of these are connected. And we see that this is exactly, again, this is exactly equivalent to satisfiability. Why? Well, uh, because uh, how can you find such a set? The set should be independent. This means that you cannot take two vertices from one block, right? Because in each block, all of them are connected. So if you take, say, this and this, you immediately fail. So as k is the number of blocks, here k equals 4. And at the same time, k is the number of mm, vertices we need in our independent set. This would mean that um, the independent set should include exactly one vertex from each block, right? So in our CNF, this means that it includes exactly one literal from each clause of the conjecture normal form. Okay? And uh, 
then uh, yeah and uh, finally we enforce this set to be non-contradictory because if we take say from one block we take x and say from another block we take not x this will be not an independent set because they are connected any two contradictory ones are connected and this yields um, the needed result so again i think yeah it is here so given a three cnf phi we uh, construct this pair so again uh, you have a formula in three cnf the formula is here this graph is constructed in polynomial time so it's polynomial function from the formula and uh, the number k is just the number of clauses, so it's also polynomially computable given the formula. So this means that uh, we have a reduction function which, given a formula, yields us a graph in number k. And the formula is satisfiable if it's satisfiable if no leaves, this graph has an independent set of size k. And this will give us the necessary result. So what does this mean? It means that. Um, 3 CNF is reducible to inset. Arbitrary, so 3 SAT is reducible to inset. Uh, so SAT is reducible to 3 SAT by sating. And an arbitrary, uh, an arbitrary NP, for NP problem A is reducible to SAT. So by transitivity of reductions, which means just composition of reducing functions, any problem which belongs to NP is reducible to this problem which is called inset. So this means that inset is NP hard. It's NP complete because it itself is NP. So for example, finding a three coloring in a graph, three color, is reducible to inset. So it's absolutely unclear how can you do it, say, explicitly. So given a graph which you wish to color in three colors, you can construct another graph which has an, an, an a number k which has an independent set of k elements if and only if the original graph g was colorable in three colors what how can you do it well it's there are good exercises to do this explicitly and to make these reductions explicitly and they are not meaningless because if you have some heuristic solutions say for set or inset you can mm, use them by reduction for that but uh, the general theorem says that this reduction always exists and the hard part of this reduction is the first step from this problem say three color a so here you can do it even in an easier way you can reduce three color to sat and you can see that here uh sorry Somewhere here, yeah. So this is the reduction of three colors to set. This rough three colorable means that this formula is satisfiable, right? Now this formula is a three CNF already, and from this formula you can generate a graph which has a clique of a corresponding size. So actually, this would mean that you, from the original graph for for each vertex, you include many many values new vertices like ri gi bi several times for each clause you get a bigger graph and in this bigger graph you should find an independent set of the corresponding size and this independent set will directly encode the color of the graph so here we avoided using cook leaven because we just had a direct reduction to three set so three color reducible to three set three set reducible to independent set so this is uh, how it actually works okay so um that's about all for the theory of np completeness in our maybe we'll at some point also i will show if i have time of the last lecture we'll show the np hardness of hamiltonian cycle there is the encoding so again the, the idea will be absolutely the same will be you have a three cnf and you should reduce it to so for the three cnf you should find a graph which is uh, uh, in which the satisfying assignment is somehow encoded by a Hamiltonian cycle or a Hamiltonian path. A, re a Hamiltonian path is a path which goes through each vertex exactly once. 
This is harder than this example, but it's also the same idea. And in our practical class, we'll show that three color is NP hard. So um, now we, uh, I will, before going forward, I will tell something about how our work will be organized for the remaining part of the course. So we have we're already uh, after the equator of the course. So the fourth lecture, fourth practical class today will also happen. And uh, uh, we have six in our, in our module just due to the number of weeks. So uh, you already have homework number one. You will also have homework number two, which at the deadlines, and not the deadlines, but the uh, periods for you will overlap. So uh, the homework number two, I will also post it by email and on Teams. It will be published uh, by the end of this week, say on Friday, and you have virtually a week to solve it. It's a theoretical, not programming homework, so it will be like the problems we solved in class. So on the next class, uh, in the prag on the lecture also. So the next uh, Wednesday, I remind, it's, it should be the deadline for your homework number one. And then we'll, so the deadline for homework number two will be the Friday after the next class. I will put it all on the web page, so you don't need to memorize it now. And in the next theoretical class, we will uh, post this third programming assignment, the final one, which will be uh, on social network analysis. So we'll discuss some uh, how to have some properties on graphs and stuff like that. And this will be an easier one, much easier than you have been doing as your um, homework number one, and it will be for one week. So the design of these deadlines is so that at the, you know, at the last class, all the, dead, all the deadlines should have passed and everything should be settled, but you are, already know your marks. And uh, finally, then there will be a final exam. The date will be on the, in this midterm session. And there will be also, it will be like homework one, a theoretical, midterm, a theoretical final exam. So this is our working. And the last lecture, well, it will be in a sense, uh, well, it will be, the last one, and uh, at the last lecture, we'll dis discuss something which goes beyond the P and NP problematics, and we'll start something today with that. So, uh, but the next lecture will be on social network analysis. So, uh, again, let's go a bit beyond decision problems. Recall that an NP decision problem is the question whether there exists a witness such that something holds, right? The witness should be a polynomial size, right? So examples, satisfiability. The witness is the satisfied assignment, right? Colorability of a graph. The witness is coloring. Independent set. Again, the witness is the set itself. Many, many other examples like that. So a, a more interesting problem is the search problem. So the search problem, if there is no witness, it says no. But if a witness exists, it should yield at least one. So this is what you had in your uh, first homework. The second part of it was that you should not all only answer satisfiable or not, but you also say, if yes, you say that uh, this is the satisfying assignment. Of course, this witness is not always unique. There would be many satisfying assignments, for example. And as it is not unique, you have to yield just one of them, an arbitrary one. Another problem which we will discuss in two weeks is the counting problem. It's sharp P class. It should yield the number of witnesses which are satisfied. So it could be zero, then the answer is no. It could be more than zero, then the answer is yes. But you yield the number. This is potentially harder than search problem or decision problem. You have to count them. And uh, you cannot just say, OK, I will yield all the witnesses and then, then I will count them because there could be an exponential number of them. So suppose you have a Boolean formula, which is just a tautology. You have two power and satisfying assignments. You cannot just yield them all. But you can somehow check the formula for tautology and say, OK, it's tautology, therefore it's two power. And finally, there could be a question of yielding all witnesses. And this is like, I don't know, Google search. So when you search, something using the search engine, you're supposed to yield 
objects which uh, mm, follow the pattern of your searching or, uh, or say you apply to a database and uh, you have a, a SQL query. It should yield all the objects which uh, satisfy the, uh, our formula. So say we can yield all satisfying assignments for a Boolean formula. But of course you cannot do it in polynomial time because it could be what they call unconditional non-polynomial. That the answer, the set of all satisfying assignments, for example, could be exponential itself. I say unconditionally because, well, beforehand we had this theory of NP and P and NP hardness. So when you say that something is NP complete, some people say that this means that it's not solvable in polynomial time, right? It, there's a usual uh, common sense idea of what is an NP complete thing. But this is not mathematically true. Well, it's not mathematically rigid because uh, it could be the case that P equals NP. So that means that, say, SAT is not polynomially solvable, but this is a conditional statement. It's not polynomially solvable if P is not equal to NP. Here it's unconditional non polynomial because uh, the, just the answer is exponential. You cannot yield an exponential result in polynomial time. Um, so for search problem, if P happened to be equal to NP, then any search problem would also be polynomially solvable. Why? Because you can just do a dichotomy. For example, if you have satisfiability, and satisfiability is a typical NP problem, uh, and suppose you have, you want to find a satisfying assignment, or you just check whether either formula is not satisfiable, you say no. If it is satisfiable, you check, okay, maybe P1 could be zero. You substitute it. If it becomes non-satisfiable, you take, okay, I'm wrong, P1 should be one. Then I take P2 again, I do dichotomy, and this process is a polynomial time searching algorithm, right? So, uh, because you just take, so if P equals NP, then satisfiability checking is polynomial, and uh, you just do it n times. Or n is the number of variables, they are still polynomial. So this means that if you can solve uh, decision problems fast, in a fast way, you can also solve, uh, uh, you can also solve uh, search problems. It's not the same search, it's, it's, you should use your decision problem several times, it's polynomial boost, boosting. So, for example, you know that 2CNF is polynomial time solvable. This gives you an algorithm for solving this search problem for 2CNF. If you know how to check whether a 2CNF is satisfiable, you know how to find a satisfying assignment. Again, it was second part of your homework number one. Uh, you, we basically did this, we did the dichotomy. We optimized it in a sense, so if we found uh, isolated literals, then we already knew the satisfying uh, the assignment for these literals. But if we were, if we didn't know it, then we just chose the value for this literal arbitrary for this variable. So P1 equals zero. So therefore, we know that two CNF is uh, satisfiability is polynomial. Search problem is also polynomial. But this is due to the fact that uh, substituted into a 2CNF also use a 2CNF. The counting problem could be harder than the decision one. This is an important thing, and we'll discuss it um, on the next um, uh, in two weeks. So, uh, how the counting problem could be harder. So, suppose we have DNF set. So it is satisfiability for disjunctive normal forms. Okay, so what about decision problem for DNF set? Let's recall it. How do you check satisfiability for a DNF? Well, what does it mean to satisfy a DNF, a big disjunction? To find one clause which is satisfiable. How do you satisfy a clause which is a conjunction? Or you just check that it's non contradictory. So, checking DNF for satisfiability, this is uh, 
are easy. So you just take the first clause. If it's contradictory, check the second, the third. If you find a non-contradictory clause, you are right. So again, using the trick which is given here, the dichotomy, you also can solve the search problem for DNF, right? How do you solve it? Well, uh, you find out whether it is satisfiable. If yes, you say, okay, we'll try P Z P1 equals zero. Again, check for satisfiability. If we check to our right, if not, then check P P1 equals one, and so on and so forth. So for DNF set, search problem, decision problem are is easy. For the yielding all witnesses, well, for DNF set, this could be hard because the DNF would have a, many, a great amount of witnesses, right? But now let's think about the counting problem. And we claim that if P is not equal to NP, then the counting problem for DNF set is not solvable in fast manner, right? So uh, why is this the case? Well, suppose we have a fast algorithm which solves the number of satisfying assignments for a DNF. Uh, so it, it says, OK, this DNF has, say, 100 satisfying assignments. This means that this, in the same way, we can solve, find the number of satisfying assignments for the negation of the DNF, right? Because they are dual, and uh, if you have something set satisfying the DNF, then it will falsify its negation. And therefore, if we count the number of satisfying assignment for DNF, and then subtract it from 2 power n, we get the number of satisfying assignment for its negation, right? But what is the negation of a DNF? By De Morgan, it's equivalent to a CNF. And therefore, if we can count the number of satisfying assignments for a DNF, we can count the number of satisfying assignments for CNF, right? But if we can find the number of satisfying assignments for CNF, we can compare it with zero. And this means that if we can solve the counting problems for counting problem for DNF, we can solve disability for CNF. And disability for CNF is NP hard. So with the counting, this is this trick. We'll talk about it once more. Uh, two weeks, but this is just that counting is hard. And the final note, notice that if the problem of yielding all witnesses, well, it's not polynomial, but we'll also discuss what is called algorithm with polynomial delay. So we uh, have an algorithm which runs as a process, and it sometimes outputs something. And the idea is that it should input, uh, it should output uh, witnesses one by one, with polynomial computations between them. So it starts in polynomial time, it yields the first witness, then it all continues working, it works another polynomial amount of time, and it yields the second witness, and then again the third, and finally in the end it also works on polynomial time and says that no, no more witnesses. So this is exactly the idea you see in, say, internet search. So you ask for something on the internet, and what does your search engine give you? It works very really fast, so polynomial. In polynomial time, it yields you some, say, 10 best solutions for your, uh, for your query. Then it stops and asks for your interaction. If you don't like this, you can say, give me another, the other 10 and other 10 and other 10. It is all performed in polynomial time. But if you ask, your, if you ask Google to give you all the possible web pages which include your search query. Of course, you will get burden. It will be non-polynomial. It will be really large because it's uh, the, there could be millions of them. It also solves, by the way, the counting problem because you just said the million of search results, but this, this could be hard. Again, uh, using the dichotomy, you can, say, for two CNF, you can solve this polynomial today. Oh, well, of course, it's an approximation. But uh, the idea is that the result, so this is an unconditional non polynomial. So the DNF set is easy, but yielding all the satisfying assignments is hard, not because it's hard to compute, just because it's hard to write them down. 
So this this is the the, 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 the real idea here. So it's uh, it's not uh, actually this non-polynomiality is not about complexity, because complexity means that it's really hard to compute something, and the result could be just one bit, like in the decision problem. So the result is small, but it's hard to find. And uh, another situation when just well, it's easy to compute, but it's the result is just huge, and so it's, you cannot just print it out because it's really big. So another example, for example, you have a set. And you want to write down all its say permutations, all its orderings, or all its subsets, its exponential or even factorial number of them. It's not the case that this is hard to compute. The natural algorithm does it. There's some gray code or something like that. But the problem is that the result is enormous. You don't. Okay, so we're about to stop well again we stop a bit early because the material is sort of very dense let's just recall what we've done today so we started with uh we recall the notion of np completeness that a problem is np hard if any np problem is uh, reducible to it and in np complete it's uh, np hard problem inside np we formulate and prove the cook levin theorem that satisfiability is one of these np complete problems so there was a concrete example how to reduce three coloring of a graph to set. So for a graph, this is a graph, it's recolorable. It's the same as the following Boolean formula is satisfiable. So it's a reduction to set. And there is a general proof which reduces uh, general non-deterministic theory machines to set. That this protocol is encoded as a Boolean matrix and it should satisfy a specific very big Boolean formula. Next, we uh, considered two other NP complete problems. So three sat, and we use Satan transformations to have an arbitrary Boolean form reduced to a three CNF equal satisfiable. And notice that Cook Levin was the hardest theorem here. Once we managed, so in Cook Levin, we had to reduce honestly each NP problem to, to set, an arbitrary problem to set. And next, when we prove something being NP hard, we just take a concrete already known NP complete problem and reduce it to our problem. So for 3 CNF, we didn't need to reduce any arbitrary problem A. We reduce just set. We just set to 3 set, and then we reduce, say, um, 3 set to independent set. You could reduce 3 set to Hamiltonian cycle and so on and so forth. When you prove something being NP hard, you just take your favorite NP complete problem and reduce it there. You, it could be sad, but it could be something more graph theoretic or something like that. There are plenty of them. And this is the usual workflow that there are, either you try to provide a polynomial time algorithm. If you fail, then usually in computer science, you try to prove NP hardness of your given problem. And then people abandon search for polynomial time algorithms. And this prevents them from proving p equals np. So uh, if, if, if it is true, it could be true. So this is how it works. Uh, and the usual thing in practice is that uh, problems of the np class are either polynomially solvable, this is the easy situation, and then you have optimize it, you try to find some better uh, solutions. For example, the problem which is p but it's hard it's uh, mm, uh, checking for of a uh, natural number to be prime it's a hard problem but it, it was proved to be polynomial but it's a called aks algorithm for the first names of the authors of it but the degree of the polynomial is something like 11 there so it's hard so usually either you have a polynomial algorithm or you manage to prove and be hard and this uh, is the usual situation. If the problem is NP hard, then people, well, they start crying and saying that the world is too hard and try to find maybe some fragments of the problem which are uh, better and polynomially solvable or to apply some SAT solvers, reduce it to SAT and apply heuristic algorithms which do it and stuff like that. But it's a hard business. In fact, there are problems, there exist problems which are, if, if P is not equal to NP, which are strictly in between. Such problems do exist, 
but they, this is quite rare species. It's not the usual case. So usually this is either NP hard or P, but actually there is something in between. If P is not equal to NP. If P is equal to NP, of course everything collapses. And finally, we discussed a bit something which is beyond. So it is search problem, counting problem, and finding all the witnesses. This will be for the class in two weeks. Okay. So thank you. And uh, we finish our lecture here and we reconvene for the practical class in half an hour or something like that, according to the timetable.